I wanted to um, take just a, a minute today, and I'm going to address something that's maybe a little more academic in nature, because as as hard as it is for us to believe that someone would disparage our beloved C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia, it happens. And people have said some um, relatively unkind things about Chronicles of Narnia. So I wanted to first of all start with just a few of the positive criticisms that have come out of this and uh, let you know that he has been a great influence on some of our very modern day um, children's writers. For example, Lloyd Alexander and his Chronicles of Pridian that won the Newbery Award in 1969. Uh, Susan Cooper's The Dark is Rising, which is a five-volume series, and then Madeline Le Engel's uh, A Wrinkle in Time, which won the Newbery Award in 1963. However, uh, those are the kind things. So I'm going to dwell just a little bit on the unkind things and try to present a counter uh, to those things. So I wanted to start with the criticism. Uh, a criticism by Philip Pullman. And I'm not going to talk very much about Philip Pullman. Miss Lewis is going to do that later. But this is an important quote. He says that death is better than life. Boys are better than girls. Light-colored people are better than dark-colored people, and so on. There is no shortage of such nauseating drivel in Narnia if you can face it. So I'm going to look real briefly at the charge of racism, the charge of misogyny, and the charge of Christianity. So we'll start with, um, with racism. And his uh, quote, that light-colored people are better than dark-colored people. And the critics then will point to the, uh, the colormans out of the horse and his boy because they are dark-skinned, because they wear flowing robes and turbans. And at this point, many claim that the colormans become a stand-in for Muslims, which is not true because Muslims, of course, are uh, monotheistic. They only claim one god. The colormans are polytheistic. They serve many gods, and many are mentioned throughout the, uh, the, uh, the, the Chronicles of Narnia. In fact, it's almost a reference to the Moors at this particular time. Another criticism that you will see as you read the novels is that you will see the use of the term darkie when it refers to the colormans. In our post 9-11 society, we are very, very sensitive to that. For Lewis, it was not meant to be a disparaging statement. It was part of the vernacular of the time. And as I'm gonna uh, talk about in just a minute, You'll see that there's a, a reason for that. I'm going to try not to get ahead of my slides. I am notorious for doing that. Uh, and so I'm going, to try, I'm going to try my best to stay with my, uh, with my slides. Um, so as a counter to that, one of the things that we see is that much of what Lewis wrote about was shaped by the imagination, the great wars of, of his time period, and the colormans then we see will be based on slightly distinguished versions of the ravaging Turk, which was just sort of a nightmare for all European children for almost a half a millennium. They were told horror stories of, uh, of the invading Turks and all the terrible things that would happen. Um, many also will argue that Lewis lived in a time that was less sensitive than ours. Um, certainly, maybe not quite as, as sensitive. But one of the things that I think that it's important to remember is that Lewis had evil characters say evil things in order to prove a point. So the things that are said are actually said by evil characters who would say such evil things. And so there was a reason for that. He wants to point out that prejudice is wrong, and he wants to have evil characters say the evil things so that children will not want to be like those particular characters. One of the things I think that is often missed by critics is that Narnia is extremely multiracial. 
Uh, you see it in, in almost every aspect, in almost every uh, single novel. And uh, he points to the fact that even Dr. Cornelius um, is um, uh, sort of a, a, a mixed race. And one of the points he wants to make is that often a racist will be more critical of someone of mixed race because you will see that uh, that type of interracial relationship shows that the races can actually uh, interact and, and live harmoniously um, together. One of the things I think that is most often missed by critics is that the Kalormans are not viewed negatively because of the color of their skin. They're viewed negatively because they engage in idolatry. And that is something that what Lewis looked uh, very unfavorably upon. Uh, we also see some very honorable Kalormans. Uh, Emeth, for example, is viewed very favorably. The white witch is not viewed favorably at all. Lewis makes a point of talking about just how white the white witch is when he says her face was white, not merely pale, but white like snow or paper or icing sugar, except for her very red mouth, which came out of the, the horse and his boy. Um, I also want to point out um, his portrayal of uh, avarice who was a Kalorman. She was the female protagonist of The Horse and His Boy. She is portrayed as being resourceful, determined, and intelligent. So she was depicted in a very positive light. She actually marries Shasta, her white protagonist, forming an interracial marriage. So in that respect, Lewis was ahead of his time uh, because that just really didn't uh, happen. So just a, a final little comment about uh, racism. One of the things I want to remember is that first of all, um, racial diversity is just embedded. It's fundamental to Narnia. Secondly, Nicobrick, if you remember Nicobrick, who at one point said of the Kalormans, I hate them. I hate them worse than the humans. Nicobrick is condemned for his ethnocentrism and the fact that he was so uh, prejudiced in his uh, viewpoints. I think Lewis really wants his readers to see that, that he was not uh, racist. If he were, he would not have an interracial marriage take place that was very successful, actually. Um, so that was just, uh, just a brief little comment about uh, racism. Another charge that we see leveled against um, uh, Lewis and his chronicles is that uh, it is full of misogyny or sexism. So here is the claim. Lewis hates women, and his novels indicate that women need to be put in their place. I think that's a real misreading of the, of the novel myself. So we go back to Philip Pullman's statement, boys are better than girls. Many times people or critics point to the idea that the, the female characters aren't the ones in the, on the front lines of battle wielding the swords. Well, okay, who really wants to do that? Uh, uh, you know, I think that is a wise move on their part. Not, you know, let me just stand back and I will pray for you uh, <laughs> as you go into to battle. Uh, but critics point out then and say that makes him sexist. I don't think so. Um, you've got to remember sort of the code of chivalry that uh, he was actually writing from. And he does not depict his female characters as brainless because they just really are not. And so we can look at Lucy Pevensey. She is probably the most prominent morally mature character in the eyes of the narrator. Uh, she is not beautiful. Um, and she's a bit envious of Susan, her sister. But when, one of the points I think that Lewis wants to make is that beauty isn't everything and that you can be acceptable and you can be intelligent and successful without being beautiful. I think that if Lewis were going to live up to the charge of sexism, then all of his female characters would be drop-dead gorgeous and not have a brain in their head. And that is just not true in this novel at all. 
Uh, she is also the first to go through the wardrobe. She is often described as more reliable and more truthful than her brother Edmund. She is the one who most often sees Aslan. And eventually she is called upon to lead a group of four older males when they get lost in the woods in Prince Caspian. Uh, and at one point, I think one of the characters was criticized because they say uh, girls don't carry maps around in their brains. And I think her reply was, that's because we have something in our brains. Uh, and, you know, not maps. We don't have maps. Uh, and, and that's okay. Uh, she is also... Uh, the one who is actually uh, given the distinction of speaking the last line of human dialogue in the last battle. So one of the things that we see is that I think Lewis actually affirms the role and the accomplishments of, of female uh, characters. You know, and I really think back... At, uh, because I've read a lot of feminist criticism, and one of the l charges leveled against Christianity is that... Christianity is, is oppressive to women, and I think it's just the opposite, actually. In Scripture, over and over and over again, you can see Christ affirming women. It's just prolific in, in Scripture, and I think Lewis does the same thing in the Chronicles of Narnia. And so just real briefly, I want to uh, point out a couple of other um, female protagonists, Polly, Jill, and Avarice, and they are all as capable as their male counterparts, Diggory, Eustace, and, um, and Shasta. Another um, criticism that is leveled against many of his female characters, especially Susan, is the fact that Lewis doesn't want them to grow up. And so we get the claim that Lewis is opposed to girls growing up and having romances. We, they point to Polly when she says about Susan, grown up indeed. I wish she would grow up. She wasted all her school time wanting to be the age she is now, and she'll waste all the rest of her life trying to stay that age. Her whole idea is to race to the silliest time of one's life as quick as she can and then stay there as long as she can. Um, Jill says Susan has, is no longer a friend of Narnia and is interested in nothing except lipstick and nylons and invitations. The operative word here is nothing else because it is not the fact that she is interested in lipstick and nylons and invitations. It's the fact it's the only thing she is interested in. It's the fact that she has allowed these things to take the place of the important things, her siblings and all things uh, spiritual. Remember at one point when um, she is asked to come back to Narnia and she decides that Narnia, in a sense, almost religion, and refers to them as the funny games they played when they were children. So she has become, in Lewis's eyes, a fundamentally silly person that's only interested in the superficial uh, things of, of life and who thinks of Narnia as a childhood type of uh, fantasy. Um, so this is, is one of the... Uh, the criticisms that Lewis hates women and doesn't want them to grow up, that they're just vain and superficial. One of the things that I think they also failed to overlook in The, uh, the Magician's Nephew, for example, um, men, the male characters, can be just as vain and affected by vanity. In fact, Uncle Andrew is described in The Magician's Nephew as being as vain as a peacock. Uh, and so it, it happens. One of the things, though, that we don't see is that Uncle Andrew is not disparaged for his, his vanity. And I think that, and this is just my own little interpretation of this, perhaps. If this were Edmund, and Susan, if Susan were Edmund, and, Su and Edmund had been the one to grow up to no longer be a friend of Narnia because he was interested in football and parties and girls he would not be disparaged for being vain and superficial. In fact, he would be lauded for having maturity. Uh, and so it, it's, a, it's a false claim that is totally um, unrealistic. Um, 
he is also, and this is probably sort of getting ahead of my thing of, of Christianity, but also one of the things that you will see that is questioned is the idea of healing and Diggory's mother in the uh, magician's nephew. Uh, his mission, of course, Aslan asks him to pluck a tree, an apple from the tree of life and plant it so the tree of protection can grow in Narnia. Uh, Diggory's mission is not to find an apple to heal his mother. That suggestion comes from Jadis or the White Witch. It's the whole temptation story. Uh, he resists this temptation, fulfills his commission from Aslan. Aslan then says to him, the day would have come when both you and she would have looked back and said it would have been better to die in that illness. Aslan also then gives Diggory a second apple, which brings joy instead of pain and sorrow because he followed uh, obedience. The last thing I want to touch on very quickly, because I want to be sure and give Miss Lewis plenty of time, is the charge that um, it, it is a Christian novel. Well, yes, <laughs> it is. Uh, but uh, one of the, the critics say, and this is, uh, Alan Jacob says that one of the charges leveled out of the Narnian is that of all the Christian beliefs with which atheists disagree, the only one that seems to generate real and deep rage is the belief in eternal life, the offer of pie in the sky by and by, and the corollary belief that the eternal life that some people choose is a miserable one. So one of the biggest things that critics have against Narnia is the fact that there are elements of Christianity uh, throughout, and they don't like it, not one little bit. Uh, and they point to Susan. Susan, once again, becomes um, sort of the, the punching bag of critics, and she's held up as the example of why Christianity is a bad thing. Because while most critics will say, let me back up and say it this way, while most critics will say that some of the other heroic characters have flaws, that Susan, poor little Susan, is the one who is barred from entering Narnia at the end of the series and is never given a chance for forgiveness at all. Um, and so, or a chance to, you know, to, to enter heaven. So seemingly, she is not allowed into the heavenly Narnia at the conclusion of the last novel of the series, The Last Battle. But she is not condemned in that novel. She's not even present in that novel at all. She's back in England with her parties and invitations and lipstick and nylons uh, and all. So she's not there. She's not condemned. Also, uh, Susan does not disappear into Aslan's huge black shadow. I think Lewis makes a real point not to condemn anyone at this particular uh, point. We just don't know. Susan's not there. At one point, a, a reader actually wrote to Lewis and asked him, what about Susan? Why didn't she get to go to heaven? Why wasn't she there when everyone else entered in uh, to the heavenly Narnia? As uh, Lewis replies and said, the book doesn't tell us what happened to Susan. She is left alive in this world at the end, and perhaps she will get to Aslan's country in, in the end, in her own way. So we don't know. He leaves it open. There is still the possibility that Susan will come back to Aslan and Narnia. At the very end of the Dawn Trader, I think that there's a little bit of foreshadowing. When Lucy asks Aslan, will you tell us how to get into your country from our own world? And Aslan replies, I shall be telling you all the time. The idea that Aslan then will continue to call to Susan. He's not going to stop calling and showing her and pointing her the way to Narnia, just as Christ never stops calling to us and pointing us the way to heaven. We have to hear it, because I think that's one of the important things that many critics miss. Um, Aslan didn't bar Susan from entering heaven. She was still alive. She hadn't died yet. So, of course, she couldn't go. Uh, Susan had barred herself at this point because she gives up on the idea of Narnia and sees it only as a fantasy world. So, I think that's the important thing to remember is that you have to read um, the, the chronicles 
with, with an open mind. And you can't do a lot of, of card stacking, as I think many critics do. And so uh, Philip Pullman is certainly one of the major critics. And at this point, I want to be sure and give Miss Lewis time. So I'm going to hand it over to her. And she is going to uh, conclude our little series there. So thank you very much. Well, I'm very mindful of the time, so I'm going to be pushing it. Um, my, oh, I guess I have control here, huh? There we go. The last section that I'm going to talk about is why I returned to Narnia in the 20th first century. Um, I chose that image intentionally. What I wanted was something to convey the idea of a contrast because I am going to show why by means sometimes the best way to show is, is to show what something is by way of what it is not. And that's what I'm going to do by contrasting uh, C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia with Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials series. But when I found this image, which isn't like you, you can distinguish clearly the lion from the background, I like it because of something Megan mentioned today, and it was mentioned earlier. You know that often in the Chronicles, one of the characters, and, it, and it's usually Lucy, who can see Aslan when the other characters can't. And that's because Aslan, like Jesus, is not always easily discernible if you're not looking for him. And so I love that image. Michael Ward asks, which popular fairy tale adventure begins with a girl hiding in a wardrobe? Don't you know? Here's a clue. The girl's name is four letters long and begins with L. Not got it yet? Another clue. She finds that the wardrobe is much bigger than she'd thought. Still no idea? Final clue. The book was written chiefly for children, but it is enjoyed as much by adults, and its author's home is in Oxford. Now, that all sounds like the Chronicles of Narnia, but it's not. He speak, well, it can apply to both the Chronicles of Narnia, but also Philip Pullman's the, His Dark Materials trilogy. The first book in the series is The Golden Compass. You may be familiar with it through the movie. This is an image from the movie. The main character there is Lyra Belacqua. The uh, polar bear that she's riding on is Yorick uh, Bernison. Greg Easterbrook says, Lewis's and Pullman's series take place on Earth and in a parallel world. Both have as protagonists astonishingly capable children. You know who the children are in the Chronicles of Narnia in uh, His Dark Materials? It's Lyra, but also her friend Will. You know that the subtext of both is the search for the divine. But in Lewis's books, children seek the divine in order to experience happiness and perfect love. Whereas in Pullman's trilogy, they seek it in order to destroy it. The plots of his dark materials are driven by the premise that God is evil, a celestial imposter who pretends to have created the universe and so, who so intensely hates flesh and blood that he wants people to live a repressed, joyless existence followed by hell, even for the righteous. Megan made a comment, I think... I have a lot of ideas in my head, y'all. I can't remember who said what at this point. Uh, but let me read just quickly. This is in the third book of the series called The Amber Spyglass. It is uh, in the land of the dead. And this is from a Christian martyr. She says, when we were alive, they told us that when we died, we'd go to heaven. And they said that heaven was a place of joy and glory, and we would spend eternity in the company of saints and angels praising the Almighty in a state of bliss. That's what they said, and that's what led some of us to give our lives and others to spend years in solitary prayer while all the joy of life was going to waste around us, and we never knew, because the land of the dead isn't a place of reward or a place of punishment. It's a place of nothing. The good come here as well as the wicked, and all of us languish in this gloom forever with no hope of freedom or joy or sleep or rest or peace. Continuing up here, it says... Uh, Christian illusions about God are to blame for all the world's miseries. Christianity is a very powerful and convincing mistake. That's all, one character declares. That character is a former nun. She says that in The Amber, Amber Spyglass, the third book of the series. 
The protagonists in the book strive to acquire ancient, mysterious objects they can use to bring about God's death. Along the way, children are tortured and murdered, often with church approval. Church approval. Now, all that sounds far-fetched, but it all does happen in the series. This is the parallel, or two representations of the parallel universes in his dark materials. On the left, you have Lyra's world, which is um, Oxford University. In Will's time, it's also Oxford, but they're in two parallel worlds. Oops, go back. These images I chose, they convey what is, I think, true about this series. It's compelling. It's well-written. It's enticing. You look there and you see a ferret. You see an airship, a, a ship, dog sledge. You see over here like a science, science outpost in the Arctic with the aurora borealis. What you don't see is that the ferret is actually Lyra's demon, D-A-E-M-O-N. Demons are, are characters in the, the books. They are like familiar spirits, or I've read some call them the mirror of the soul. Um, Lyra's mother, Mrs. Coulter, is a representative of the church. They're the ones, when the, in the quote that mentioned children are tortured, the church is trying to separate children from their demons because another, and this is, I've been wrestling, how can I say this simply to get people to understand this complex trilogy in this few minutes of time? But um, Lyra's mother is a representative of the church who Pullman represents as the evil ones in the book. She wants to help the church or the church wants to separate children from their demons because it's all about the idea of uh, wanting to, the church wants to keep children in a state of innocence. There are some other quotes coming up where what Pullman is concerned about is showing that, because there's, there's in the books um, the idea of dust, which is kind of a hard concept to grasp, but it's like an individual, uh, an individual's consciousness or what it is that creates or makes their being. It's their thought processes, their imagination, uh, their curiosity, their passions. So in the novels, they're headed to the Arctic because Lyra's father, Lord Azrael, has seen a city in the Aurora Borealis, and he wants to get to that city. But in the context of the novels, he also has an agenda to overthrow the kingdom of God. He wants to bring about a new kingdom because... Um, You'll see in quotes coming up, what Pullman is against is any kind of restriction on individuals. We should have total free reign, free choice. It's interesting also in these books, God is not in them. There is the authority, and I've read uh, many comments about one of the criticisms of the books because Christians say Pullman is out to kill God, and people say, no, that's not true. He doesn't ever say that, that uh, the authority is God. The authority is a created being who masquerades as God. But it's interesting to me that there is no God in this series, and I'll show you a quote that supports why that is. So it's enticing. At the end of the first book, though, it ends with Lyra's father wanting to, to get into that city he sees, but he needs this huge burst of energy to get there. He gets that burst by sacrificing Laura, uh, Lyra's best friend, Roger. Leads to the subtle knife. Lyra father, uh, follows her father into this other world. She meets Will Perry. It's interesting his name is Will, which can represent the human will. Will's task is to get the subtle knife that can, and uh, I included the tower on the left because they go into an Italian city called Chittagatske where there are no adults because the adults are tormented by specters. The children are the only ones who live in this city, but Will fights a man for this knife because it's his task to carry it, to wield it. With it, he can cut through the fabrics between the parallel universes. And over here on the right, you see um, in the books, it can be just a, a regular street and Will is able to cut through and the kids can walk out there and they close the hole back up. The third book gets a little bit odd. There's some uh, beings, the, the animals, are they're not really animals, but the mulafa, which it's a little bit hard to understand. But they are creatures that live in a land where dust had been plentiful. It's disappearing. It's a peaceful land. They don't have any of the issues back in that, that are in Oxford. Um, but they can do what they want. And they're peaceful beings. And they're creative beings. The, the uh, 
former nun who said that Christianity was a big mistake, she fashions the amber spyglass, which allows her to see dust. So a continuing theme through the whole set of novels is this issue of dust and the essence of humanity, which Pullman sees as um, sort of a, I wouldn't use the word divine, but a given right. From the PBS series, The Question of God, what I want to do now is I, I gave you an idea of the contrast of content. Uh, what I did not say, let me back up for a moment before I forget this. At the end of the Amber Spyglass, what's interesting, it's not that the kids kill God, but um, God is an ancient, exhausted, decrepit character or the authority he lives in a crystal sphere, and he's totally retreated and left the, the control of his universe to the angel Metatron, who used to be Enoch, who became the angel Metatron. It's very confusing. Um, but this, this creature, this god, when he emerges from the crystal sphere, he just dissolves into the atmosphere. The look on his face is relief. It's as if he's tired of having control. That's the god or the figure that Pullman represents. So what I want to contrast as quickly as possible is the idea of worldview, Lewis's worldview versus Pullman's worldview, their motivations in writing their series, and then finally the effect the books have on readers. From the PBS series, The Question of God, our worldview informs our personal, social, and political lives. It influences how we perceive ourselves, how we relate to others, how we adjust to adversity, and what we understand to be our purpose. Our worldview helps determine our values, our ethics, and our capacity for happiness. It helps us understand where we come from, our heritage, who we are, our identity, why we exist on this planet, our purpose, what drives us, our motivation, and where we are going, our destiny. Uh, Amber Cowarth is the one who said, this is all a quote from her, rather than planning to write a fictional book that succeeded in using apologetics, Lewis admits that the element of Christianity, as with Aslan, entered of its own accord. You've heard those things said earlier in this week. Lewis was one of those people who provided a refuge for the children who were evacuated from London. One of the children in his home, he had a wardrobe there, that child said, what's behind the wardrobe? That's what gave him the idea to write the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And then he had an image in his mind of a, of a fawn. And uh, the fawn was carrying a package. That's Mr. Tumnus. And then you heard Calvin George say, the, I, the lion just came bounding into the midst of the story. Walter Hooper, C.S. Lewis's biographer, describes Lewis as being the most religious man he ever met. And Peter Shackle is one also who's quoted here. For this reason, no matter what Lewis wrote, his religion would greatly impact all of his works. Megan spoke about that this morning. You cannot escape your worldview, and the worldview that comes through Lewis's fiction is his Christian worldview. What you see in contrast from quotes from Pullman, Pullman said this, what is there in this Tweedy medievalist that attracts such devoted and growing attention? There is no doubt in my mind that Narnia is one of the most ugly and poisonous things I've ever read. I hate the Narnia books, and I hate them with deep and bitter passion with their view of childhood as, go as a golden age from which sexuality and adulthood are a falling away. That's part of the dust. He would like to keep the dust, keep the, the emphasis on freedom of choice and, and a person's right to express their um, personhood in any way. He also says, if there is a God, and he is as the Christians describe him, then he deserves to be put down and rebelled against. As you look back over the history of the Christian church, it's a record of terrible infamy and cruelty and persecution and tyranny. How they have the nerve to tell us all to be good when, given the slightest chance, they'd be hanging the rest of us and flogging the homosexuals and persecuting the witches. Do you see Pullman's worldview coming through? He also says, all stories teach, whether the storyteller intends them to or not, they teach the world we create. They teach the morality we live by. They teach it much more effectively than moral precepts and instructions. We don't need lists of right and wrongs, tables of do's and don'ts. We need books, time, and silence. Thou shalt not is soon to be forgotten. He says very candidly, I'm trying to undermine the basis of Christian belief. Mr. Lewis would think I was doing the devil's work. And then he says, my books are about killing God. 
Now I want to contrast these next couple of slides. Uh, they're about the contrast in uh, the response of readers. What this one basically says is that people can read the Chronicles of Narnia and not be not have an understanding tangibly that they represent the allegory or the fairy tale that we've heard talk of, that they have that Christian element. And for this reason, uh, Walter Hooper says the Narnian stories have been successful in getting into the bloodstream of the secular world. But here's a quote from a 13-year-old girl named Megan. I read The Golden Compass first when I was 12. My mom wouldn't let me read the other two. She goes on and says, I've read The Golden Compass several times. I will say this now. I am a believer. I love God and believe in Him. But these books actually made me stop to think and wonder. The people that wrote the Bible, how do they know all of that in the Bible happened? People couldn't write around the time of Adam and Eve. So it makes me wonder a lot. But then I feel guilty about it because I do believe in Him. Philip Pullman, I don't care whether you are an atheist or not, but my mom does. All I have to really say is that I love your books. There are people who won't be thrown off by the worldview that comes through Philip Pullman's trilogy, but there are also people who will be enticed into what he's showing, which is a world without God. I took this picture, and I think you can probably see the point I want to make. There are Times you recognize in Pullman, like he uses, he quotes from Genesis. He says, in the beginning, God created male and female and their demons. And you know, as Christians, you don't add to the Word of God. But others have said, too, when you read Pullman, the perception or the view of, the, of Scripture or of Christianity that he portrays, you don't recognize it. He doesn't have a clear focus on it. You couldn't tell what that verse says. Can you read it there? Here it is, Proverbs 8, 27 through 30. The reason I use this is because in my own devotional times over in the past years, not getting ready for this, but years ago, having read the, the um, Golden Compass and, and the other books, I thought how this is the true representation of God. It's not the weak, uh, as Bruce Rosedahl said the other day, the God that's sitting, cringing, wringing his hands, wondering if he will win. This is wisdom speaking in Proverbs. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the seas its limits, limit, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him. The God displayed there is one of strength and power and creativity. When I was having a quiet time recently, knowing that this was coming up, when I read this passage, it struck me. People like Pullman who, who present their ideology, which is not the truth. This is what God says. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. Besides me, I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I think of Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. This is what I would submit to you. And this is an image that our marketing department did. C.J. Perez, I think it's just amazing. The book there, when I look at it, to me, I think of the Chronicles of Narnia. And I see the image of who we represent, uh, recognize as Aslan the lion, a type of Christ. What I know is that what emanates from, what radiates from the Chronicles of Narnia, while it's not Scripture itself, it has a resonance of, it, it's an accurate reflection of the goodness of God, the strength of God, the majesty of God. In my opinion, when we, when we read works like the Chronicles of Narnia, we are doing what the Scriptures said to think on these things that that impart the strength of God into our lives. So my purpose as we close is to say, why do we read the Chronicles of Narnia today in the 21st century when so many people are, quote, enlightened? It's because we need as much today as ever before, probably more so, reminders of the gospel, tangible statements that sow into our lives. And uh, so I'm very pleased to end our seminar with this note of Aslan looking over and the light of God emanating from within the series. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everybody who's participated. And uh, it's time to wrap up. Thank you.